I have to give you a fancy introduction. Uh, good afternoon. Um, President Biden is continuing to follow through on his key promise to take swift and bold action that addresses the climate crisis, building on his day one actions of rejoining the Paris Agreement and strengthening our clean air and water protections and, to, and holding polluters accountable. Today he will take executive action to tackle the climate, cli climate crisis at home and abroad while creating good paying union jobs, building sustainable <coughs> infrastructure and delivering environmental justice. Uh, I'm thrilled today as a part of our effort to bring policy experts uh, into the briefing room. We're joined by two very special guests who are going to take, talk, you, talk to you all about today's executive orders and take a few questions as well. And I will always, as always, play the role of bad cop when they have to go. Uh, National Climate Advisor Gina McCarthy uh, and Special Presidential Envoy for Climate and my former boss, former Secretary of State John Kerry. And a big day for Boston in the briefing room. So, okay, <laughs> that, go ahead. Thank you. It's a big day for Boston every day. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, today, President Biden will build on the actions he took on day one, and he'll take more steps to fulfill uh, commitments he made to tackle the climate crisis while creating good paying union jobs and achieving environmental justice. In his campaign, he and Vice President Harris put forward the most ambitious climate vision that any presidential ticket had ever embraced. And he spent more time campaigning on climate than we have ever seen. The President also has consistently identified the climate crisis as one of four interrelated existential crises that are gripping our nation all at once. And he's demanding answers that can address all four. And he's not waiting to take action, getting us started on his first day in office because science is telling us that we don't have a moment to lose to fight against all four of these crises in a way that recognizes their intersectionality. He's always committed the U.S. to re-enter, I'm sorry, he's already committed the U.S. to re-enter the Paris Climate Agreement. And he committed us as well to start undoing the assault on our environment that has occurred over the past four years, and he is now taking additional action to really target the challenge of climate change. So today for me is a very good day. Just one week into his administration, President Biden is continuing to move us forward at the breadth and the pace that climate science demands. Today's executive order starts uh, by saying it is the policy of this administration that climate considerations shall be an essential element of U.S. foreign policy and national security. That's where the big guy comes in. It gives my colleague, John Kerry, the first ever international climate envoy, the authority to really drive forward a process that will restore American leadership on climate throughout the world. And you will see and hear more about that from Secretary Kerry. But here at home, we have to do our part, or we will not be able to make the kind of worldwide change that climate change demands. So this executive order establishes a White House Office of Domestic Climate Policy, and it directs everyone who works for the President to use every tool available at our disposal to solve the climate crisis because we're going to take a whole-of-government approach. We're going to power our economy with clean energy. We're going to do that in a way that will produce millions of American jobs that are going to be good paying, that are going to be jobs that have the opportunity for workers to join a union. Because, as President Biden has often told us, when he thinks of climate change, his first thought is about jobs. And it should be, because people in this country need a job. And this is about making that happen in the most creative and significant way that the federal government can move forward. And we're going to make sure that nobody is left behind. And I'm not just talking about communities in terms of environmental justice, but workers as well. This order takes historic strides to address environmental injustice. It creates both a White House interagency task force to address environmental justice, as well as an advisory council. 
It directs the Department of Health and Human Services to create an Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, because after all, climate change is the most significant uh, public health challenge of our time. And it tasks the Department of Justice with establishing an Office of Climate Justice, because we know the communities who are being hurt, and we know we have to start enforcing the standards today and ensuring that they are part of the solution in the places that we can invest. In fact, it commits 40 percent of our investment in clean energy towards disadvantaged communities so they can benefit from the new jobs that are available and seed that better future. President Biden's order establishes a working group on coal and power plant communities because we have to make sure that in this transition, every agency in government is using every tool at their disposal to drive resources to those communities. And it fulfills long-standing commitments to leverage our vast natural resources to contribute to our clean energy future. It places a pause and review on new oil and gas leases on federal public lands and waters, consistent with a promise President Biden has repeatedly made and has been very clear in the face of efforts to distort his promise. And it sets a goal of doubling offshore wind production by 2030. In addition, he plans to sign a presidential memorandum that aims to restore scientific integrity across the federal government and earn back the public's trust, making a commitment to base solutions on the best available science and data. So today is a very big day for science and for our efforts to power our economy with good paying union jobs. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, let me say, first of all, uh, what a pleasure it is to be here with Gina. Uh, I'm a big fan of Gina's. Gina and I worked very, very closely together during the campaign uh, when we sat down to uh, bring the Bernie Sanders folks uh, uh, together around uh, the Biden climate plan. And, and she is the perfect person to be tackling uh, the domestic side of uh, this equation, which is complicated, uh, and nobody knows the details better than she does, and nobody's going to be more effective at corralling uh, everybody to move in the same direction. It's also uh, an enormous pleasure for me to be here with Jen Psaki. She mentioned that uh, nobody was her boss, but I had the privilege of uh, working with her. And she, uh, seven years ago, uh, we gathered in the State Department briefing room. She's traded up, obviously, uh, but she has not uh, uh, given away any of her fundamental principles and commitment to telling you all the truth, telling the American people the truth, and doing so with great candor and transparency. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here with her. The, uh, stakes, the stakes on climate change just simply couldn't be any higher than they are right now. Uh, it is existential. We use that word too easily. And we throw it away. But uh, we have a big agenda in front of us on a global basis, and President Biden is deeply committed, totally seized by this issue, as you can tell by this executive order and, and by the other, uh, the initiative of getting back into Paris immediately. That's why he rejoined the Paris Agreement so quickly, because he knows it is urgent. He also knows that Paris alone is not enough, uh, not when almost 90 percent of all of the planet's emissions, global emissions, come from outside of U.S. borders. We could go to zero tomorrow and the problem isn't solved. So that's why today, one week into the job, President Biden will sign this additional executive set of orders to help move us down the road, ensuring that ambitious uh, climate action is global in scope and scale, as well as uh, national here at home. Today, in the order that he will sign, that Gina has described to you, uh, he makes climate central to foreign policy planning, to diplomacy, and to national security preparedness. 
It creates new platforms to coordinate climate action across the federal agencies and departments, sorely needed. And most importantly, it commissions uh, a national intelligence estimate on the security implications of climate change to give all of us an even deeper understanding of the challenge. This is the first time a president has ever done that. And our 17 intelligence agencies are going to come together and assess exactly what the danger and damage and potential uh, risks are. The order directs the State Department to prepare a transmittal package uh, seeking Senate advice and consent on the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, an amendment that by itself, if, if ratified and fully enforced uh, globally, could hold the Earth's temperature by 0.5 of an entire degree, not insignificant. And it sets forth a process for us to develop an ambitious new Paris target, as well as a U.S. climate finance plan, both of which are essential to our being able to bring countries of the world together to raise ambition and meet this moment when we go to Glasgow for the follow-on agreement to, to Paris. So that's the only way for the world to succeed together, my friends. And so, uh, again, this is an issue where failure literally is not an option. As he committed to doing on the campaign trail, the President is announcing that he will host a leaders' summit on climate change less than three months from now, on April 22nd, Earth Day, which will include a leader-level reconvening of the major economies forum. We'll have specifics to lay out over time, uh, but uh, the convening of this, uh, of this uh, summit is essential to ensuring that, the, that 2021 is going to be the year that really makes up for the lost time of the last four years, and that the UN Climate Conference, COP26 as it's called, which the UK is hosting in November, uh, to make sure that it is an unqualified success. The road to Glasgow will be marked uh, not just by promises, but by progress at a pace that we can all be proud of, and Gina is going to be putting her uh, efforts into making certain that that is true. The world will measure us by what we can do here at home. So with these executive actions today, uh, we believe we're steps further down that journey. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's start with Nancy. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Kerry. A question for you and then for Administrator McCarthy. Um, you talked about the fact that it won't really matter what we do very much if the rest of the world doesn't do the same thing. But the U.S. has had a fairly rocky relationship with China recently. How do you plan to try to bring both China and India to the table on this issue? Well, before I, before I answer that, let me just say that uh, uh, the issue of, uh, of, of making a difference, i.e., what we do at home, uh, what I'm saying is you can't solve the problem alone, but our doing things makes an enormous difference. What Gina succeeds in pulling together is essential to our ability to have credibility in the world. Now, with respect to China, obviously we have serious differences with China on some very, very important issues. And I am as mindful of that as anybody having uh, served as Secretary of State and in the Senate. Uh, the issues of theft of uh, intellectual property and, and, and uh, access to market, South China Sea, I mean, run the list. We all know them. Those issues will never be traded for anything that has to do with climate. That's not going to happen. But climate is a critical standalone issue that we have to deal on uh, in, in the sense that uh, China is 30 percent of the emissions of the world. We're about 15 percent of the emissions of the world. You add the EU to that, and you've got three entities that are more than, than uh, 55 percent or so. So it's urgent that we find a way to compartmentalize, to move forward, and uh, we'll wait and see. But uh, uh, President Biden is very, very clear uh, about uh, the need to address the other issues with China. And I know some people have been concerned. Nothing is going to be siphoned off into one area uh, from another. And then a question for either of you on coal. Your executive order talks about oil and gas uh, on federal lands, but it doesn't really say much about coal. What is this administration's policy when it comes to coal? 
Well, in terms of the oil and gas decision, it was to, is to make sure that we take a little pause and review the entire strategy of how we're looking at public lands. So it will include looking at, at what new leases ought to be approved and sold. It's looking at our ability also to look at coal in that mix. So the program review is going to look at how we manage public lands consistent with climate, but also consistent with the, the marriage between climate and really growing jobs of the future. So it will be in the mix to be looked at, but it is, it is not at this point included. It was not part of the commitments on the campaign, but we're going to take a close look at all of it. And can I just add on your, your comment about China? Um, which I'm not going to speak to the international dynamic, but I am going to say that part of the challenge that we face here is, is a challenge that President Biden has already started to address with his Buy America pledge. We have to start not just go shifting to clean energy, but it has to be manufactured in the United States of America, you know, not in other countries. And there is going to be a large discussion about how we make sure that a lot of the investment is, is about building up our manufacturing base again. That's great jobs. That's often, hopefully, union jobs. But it is also a wonderful opportunity for us to recoup the benefits of that manufacturing and lower the cost of clean energy. Part of the way we're going to get there is by making sure the federal government buys American and that the federal government looks at its procurement across every agency so that the breadth of what we spend is spent designed to advance job growth in the United States, to advance health benefits for environmental justice communities, and to begin to tackle the very challenge the existential challenge of climate change. Jeff Mason. Uh, thank you, Jeff Mason with Reuters. Uh, question for both of you. Um, can you give us a sense of when you expect to have the so-called NDC or um, US target for cutting greenhouse gas emissions as part of the Paris Accord? And can you also give us a sense of how ambitious you plan to make that number? Will it be 40%, 50% higher than that? Well, united in this, so. yeah, I'm, I'm the dude who's supposed to deliver this in a timely way, and he <laughs> sets the timing. So that, uh, basically, we want to make sure that the NDC is something that can be announced uh, before the summit on Earth Day. And so we're going to be out of the gate working with the agencies to see what kind of reductions and mitigation opportunities there are. And also, again, to look at our public lands to make sure that we can continue to store carbon in our soil, to work with agriculture and others, to look at how we better manage our forests so we're not uh, seeing the devastating forest fires that we've been having before. So all across the federal government, every agency, and you'll see many of them specifically tasked in this executive order, will participate in the task force that we're going to have to actually develop the most aggressive NDC that we can to deliver the kind of uh, boost uh, that Secretary Kerry is looking for to be able to ensure that our international efforts are robust and, and sufficient to address the challenge internationally. Just to follow up on that, perhaps for Secretary Kerry, how do you assure international partners that the U.S. will stick to whatever you propose after having seen the Trump administration take the U.S. out of the Paris Accord? Well, well that's precisely why we're going to stick by it, and I think our word is uh, strong. I've been on the phone for the last few days talking to our allies in Europe, elsewhere around the world, uh, and they are welcoming us back. They know that this administration uh, already had a significant uh, part of what has brought us to, will bring us to Glasgow, which was the Paris Agreement. The Obama-Biden administration uh, had great credibility on this issue, and having President Biden be the person now who is driving this forward is enormously meaningful to, to, to the folks there. And they also know that I was deeply involved in the negotiations in Paris, uh, and am now asked by the President, by President Biden, to make certain that uh, we do the same at Glasgow, if not more. So I, I, I have had no one question our credibility at this point in time. Uh, someone probably will. And the answer will be that, that I think we can achieve things in the course of the next four years that will move the marketplace, the, the private sector, 
uh, global finance, uh, innovation and research, that in fact no, no one, no political person in the future would be able to undo what the planet is going to be organizing over these next months and years. Uh, this is the start of something new. I don't know if you read uh, Larry Fink's letter of BlackRock the other day, yesterday, uh, but there's a new, new awareness among major asset managers and commercial banks and others about the need to be putting resources into this endeavor because it, it, is, it is major in, in, in investment uh, demand. So I, I think uh, the, the proof will be in what we do. Neither Gina nor I are going to start, you know, throwing around a lot of big promises. But you heard what she just said, and we will work very closely because we're going to try to bring to the table to help uh, inform her and the folks she's working with what we're picking up abroad and what people are doing abroad and the steps that they're taking and how we now have to measure ourselves against them and they will measure themselves against us. We are well aware of that. Can I just add something? I just want to call attention to the fact that cities and states have really picked up the, the initiative to move forward on clean energy because the solutions are cheap the solutions compete effectively against fossil fuels. We are talking about solutions that we're not asking anybody to sacrifice, but are to their advantage. And if you look at the record over the past four years, while the prior administration might have wanted energy, clean energy to head in a different direction, it's gone faster and farther than anyone ever expected. And the idea that we could, with this new work that we're doing together, send signals to the marketplace who are purchasing at the federal level and are relooking at different ways of having on the ground change, we can build that demand. We can actually grow significantly millions of clean energy jobs. And all of a sudden, the question won't be whether the private sector is going to buy into it. The private sector is going to drive it. And so this is going to be a signal setter, the way the federal government ought to set on what our values are what we think the future needs to be. And that's, it's, this is a value-laden effort that President Biden has undertaken with full knowledge that it's going to benefit jobs, it's going to benefit our health, and it's going to lead to that future we want to hand to our children. We'll just do these two in the front, and then they will come back, I promise. Um, so go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, if you would, um, there's very certainly are oil and gas industry workers who are watching you both right now who will hear the message that, that the takeaway to them is that they are seeing an end to their livelihoods. Uh, what, what do you say to them, particularly those people who, who President Trump struck a chord with on the campaign trail when he promised to save their jobs? What is your message to them right now? And also to the oil industry executives who are listening, are you putting them on notice today? Well, we didn't come here to put anybody on notice except to the seriousness of uh, President Biden's intent to uh, do what needs to be done to deal with this crisis, and it is a crisis. Um, with respect to uh, those workers, no, <laughs> no two people are more uh, in this room are more concerned about it, and the President of the United States has expressed in every comment he has made about uh, climate the need to uh, grow the new jobs that pay better, that are cleaner, that, I mean, you know, you look at the consequences of black lung for a miner, for instance, and measure that against the fastest growing job in the United States before COVID was solar power technician. The same people can do those jobs, but the choice of doing the solar power one now is a better choice. Similarly, uh, you have uh, the second fastest growing job pre-COVID was wind turbine technician. This is happening. 75 percent, 70 percent of all the electricity that's come online in the United States in the last few years came from renewables. Not, you know, coal plants have been closing over the last 20 years. So uh, what President Biden wants to do is make sure those folks have better choices, that they have alternatives, that they can be the people who go to work to make the solar panels. They were making them here at home. That is going to be a particular focus of the uh, Build Back Better agenda. And, and I, I think that, that, unfortunately, workers have been fed a false narrative. No surprise, right, for the last few years. 
they've been fed uh, the notion that somehow dealing with climate is coming at their expense. No, it's not. What's happening to them is happening because of other market forces already taking place. And, and, and what, the, what, the, what the financiers, uh, the big banks, the asset managers, private investors, venture capital are all discovering is there's a lot of money to be made in the creation of these new jobs in these sectors. So whether it's green hydrogen that is going to come, whether it is uh, uh, geothermal heat, or whether it, whatever it's going to be, uh, those are jobs. The same worker who works in South Carolina today putting together a BMW, which happens to be made there and, and, and um, is currently an internal combustion engine, can put together a car, but it's electric. So this is not a choice between having jobs, having good jobs, having the quality of life. Quality of life will be better when Gina has put her team together that produces choices for us that are healthier, less cancer, cleaner air. The greatest, the greatest cost in America, the greatest cause of children being hospitalized every summer in the United States, we spend $55 billion a year on it, is environmentally induced asthma. That will change as we begin to rein in what we used to call pollution in this country, because it is pollution. And I think that uh, workers are going to see that with the efforts of the Biden administration, uh, they're going to have a much better set of choices. And frankly, uh, it will create more jobs than stuck where we were. Could I just add by pointing out a couple of things in the executive order that I want you to, to just call to your attention? We talked about the Civilian Conservation Corps. That is an opportunity to put younger people into work in, in vitally important efforts. But if you look at this, it also has set up a task force that is looking at the, these coal uh, communities, uh, communities that are really reliant on their local energy and utility. And it talks about how do we revitalize those economies. And it talks about how we can put people to work using the skills they currently have where they are to start looking at those old abandoned oil and gas wells that are spewing out methane or, or all of the coal that, that is uh, mines that haven't been properly closed that are doing the same that has great impact on climate but also will keep an opportunity for those, for those individual workers to have work in their own communities. We're not going to ask people to go from the middle of Ohio or, 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 or Pennsylvania and ship out to the coast to have solar jobs. You know, solar jobs will be everywhere, but we need to put people to work in their own communities. That's where their home is. That's where their vision is. So we're creatively looking at those opportunities for investment so that we can get people understanding that we are not trying to take away jobs. Remember, when, uh, when we say climate change, eventually people are going to think jobs, just like President Biden, when he hears the words climate change. And so we'll do everything we can to recognize that revitalization is necessary in these communities, to find creative ways to put them to work, and then we're going to do as Secretary Kerry says, and start investing in new technologies and new manufacturing. And that includes large manufacturing like cement and steel. That's work that we should be doing here. That's work that inevitably is going to be necessary to rebuild our infrastructure, which is also one of the biggest opportunities we have for job growth moving forward. Two quick ones. Sure. Uh, Administrator, one to you and one to the yes. Secretary, if I may. I, the, what you may hear from some corners of criticism are, is why are we doing this now when we're already in an economic crisis? You look at the state of New Mexico, where one third of the state's budget is funded by oil and gas. So why not let the country get back on its feet before we do this? Well, uh, the issue in New Mexico is that somebody uh, reported uh, a bit incorrectly, or maybe not as precisely enough, that this wasn't about impacting existing permits and fracking. This was about new leases on federal lands. So I think that the, the uh, opportunity for the states to continue to accrue the royalties from, from, uh, uh, from both coal and oil and natural gas that is 
properly done on federal lands is going to continue, and there's even an opportunity in the review of that program to look at the royalty issues, look at the job growth opportunities, look at a variety of things to make sure that public lands are being properly managed. Now, in terms of, of the job issue, we're explicitly doing this because our economy is right now stagnant. We have pe millions of people out of work, out of jobs, millions of people that are afraid they can't feed their families. If you're faced with that, what do you do? You boost the economy and you grow jobs. But why at the same time aren't we thinking about the weaknesses of our current economy in terms of the number of environmental justice communities that have been left behind, the number of people that are breathing dirty air and their kids are getting asthma. So instead, let's think about all of it at the same time. I know it's a crazy idea in your bureaucracy. You're only supposed to do one thing. Well, we're going to do and think about all of it because people need to have jobs. This is all about building the jobs of the future we want, not continuing to niddle at, at a, an economy that is no longer going to be where our future lies. Mr. Secretary, to you right now over the course of this first week, there are a lot of big priorities here. There's COVID, the economy, immigration, racial justice, now climate change. As a veteran of Congress, of the Senate, what is the priority and how quickly do you need legislation to make this permanent? Well, the, uh, Peter, the, the, uh, <laughs> the priority is precisely what the President has set out, all of them, all six of the major crises that he faces. And he's addressing every single one of them and he knows that the United States, all of us, have the ability to be able to do that. Uh, and, and the reason that has to be done is every single one of them are life and death. Every single one of them represent a challenge to the very fiber of our society. And, and the other reason, obviously everything, I agree with everything Gina said, but I'd, I'd, I'd simply add that the other reason for doing it now is the science tells us we have to. And that's one of the things the President is restoring today in the executive order is respect for science and the science office. So, I, I mean, uh, $2 trillion price tag, $2 trillion for COVID, $2 trillion for this. It's a lot of money to a lot of Americans. It's, it, it is real money, and yes, it's a lot of money. But you know what? It costs a lot more if you don't do the things we need to do. It costs a lot more. There are countless economic analyses now that show that it is now cheaper to deal with the crisis of climate than it is to ignore it. We spent $265 billion two years ago on three, three storms, Irma, Harvey, and Maria. Maria destroyed Puerto Rico. Harvey dropped more water on Houston in five days than goes over Niagara Falls in a year. And Irma had the first recorded winds at 185 miles an hour for 24 sustained hours. That last year, we had one storm, $55 billion. So we're spending the money, folks. We're just not doing it smart. We're not doing it in the way that would actually sustain us for the long term. So this is uh, critical. We're, we're, the goal of the Paris Agreement was to hold the Earth's temperature increase to 2 degrees centigrade. Even if you did everything that was in Paris, we're going up to 3.7 or 4. That's catastrophic. What President Biden is trying to do is listen to science, listen to facts, and make tough decisions about what we need to do to take the world to a better place, and particularly our own country. And that is what he is committed to doing. So, yes, there are a lot of uh, challenges right now, which sadly, all of them, were exacerbated by the last four years. Now we have to try to make up for that. And that is a hard pull, but this president is capable of doing it, and he's putting together a great team that I think can uh, help him do that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gina McCarthy. Thank you, Secretary Kerry, for joining us. Um, you're free to go. Thank go, you. To go see the president. Um, so you can all see they're uh, both experienced and passionate and tenacious, uh, having worked with, uh, with both of them in the past. So uh, the, the it, it crisis is in good hands. I know we have a short period of time here, but I just wanted to provide an update on a question that you all have been asking a bit about, which is what some of the outreach uh, our teams are doing as it relates to uh, the COVID package that is a top priority for President Biden. 
uh, as we have talked about almost every day in here, probably every day, uh, our team continues to build support for the American Rescue Plan as more and more voices across the country recognize the urgent need to get American families the help they need. We've obviously seen a broad coalition of support emerge uh, from the Chamber of Commerce to Senator Sanders and organized labor to hundreds of mayors and local public health officials. The president and vice president are engaged directly with members and have had a number of productive conversations that will continue through the course of the week and will only pick up in the days ahead. Senior White House officials are also engaging with not just congressional leaders, but also state and local officials, key constituency groups, and others to gather feedback on the proposal and move the package forward. So let me give you a couple of examples from uh, just yesterday. Chief of Staff Ron Klain engaged with members directly throughout the day, as did Senior Advisor Anita Dunn, which they will both continue to do moving forward. Counselor to the President Steve Reschetti and Office of Legislative Affairs Director Louisa Terrell are quarterbacking the team's broader legislative outreach and have had dozens of conversations with individual members to understand their priorities and receive their feedback. In addition to ongoing conversations with leadership on both sides of the aisle, already this week, Members of the National Economic Council and Domestic Policy Council and staff from Treasury have met with the relevant committees, including Senate Banking Committee, Senate Finance Committee, House Ways and Means, House Financial Services, House Education and Labor, and the Bicameral Small Business Committee. NEC Director Brian Deese is doing one-on-one -on -one briefings with members of Congress and meetings with caucuses, including yesterday's meeting, which I believe has been reported with the Problem Solvers Caucus to discuss the proposal. Hill engagement uh, will continue uh, with Jeff Zients and Brian Deese meeting with the New Dem Coalition, along with several other briefings that are scheduled. Also, our outreach isn't limited to Congress, which is vitally important. This isn't just about speaking to elected officials. This is also about speaking to the country and building support and uh, educating and engaging with leaders uh, across the country. So yesterday, Jeff Zients and his team spoke with bipartisan governors. As you all know, they talked about the COVID package by the National Governors Association, organized by them, and administration officials briefed tribal leaders and a number of mayors yesterday as well. And the Office of Public Engagement, led by Cedric Richmond, briefed civil rights groups yesterday, including the NAACP, the National Action Network, Justice Action Network, Urban League, Coalition of Black Civic Participation, and Black Women's Roundtable. Today, they have meetings with labor leaders, advocates for young people, as well as organizations dedicated to building wealth in the black community. On Friday, OP will also, the Office of Public Engagement, I should say, I hate acronyms, uh, will convene 100 uh, presidents of historically black, black colleges and universities also to discuss this proposal. And the only other thing I wanted to mention before we get to your questions is that, as you all know, Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen was just confirmed. Uh, the president will be meeting with his economic team on Friday, including Secretary Yellen, for a briefing on the impact of delay in moving forward with the additional economic relief. Uh, with that, let's get your questions. Alex, your first day in the White House briefing room. Thank you. And Alex's first day, two Alex's first days. It's good to be here. There's an initiation afterwards that the press corps will conduct. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'll make it quick because I know you have a pretty hard out in a few minutes, but uh, I think you all have a hard out too, but absolutely. yes. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about one of your favorite topics, impeachment. Uh, nearly every Republican senator last night voted to throw out the impeachment trail against President Trump. Does President Biden have a reaction to that? Does he trust Congress to hold President Trump accountable for the insurrection against the Capitol? And does he see censure against uh, former President Trump as a viable alternative to conviction since it, it looks unlikely at this point? Well, the uh, president uh, certainly respects the role that Congress has. Senators, of course, the Senate, as they're overseeing the trial moving forward in determining the pace and the path forward uh, for holding uh, the former president accountable. That continues to be his belief in all of his conversations that he's been having with members about uh, the recovery plan. Uh, he has, uh, they have said they expect from him that his focus will be on COVID relief. That's how he will use the bully pulpit. That's how he will speak to the American people. And they are eager to work with him on that. So that's where his focus remains. And, and what steps they take to hold the former president accountable, uh, he'll leave it to them. Why the resistance on weighing in on the issue? We've, we've waited many times. The president has been asked about the issue. We put out a statement when the House uh, put out a vote, uh, voted on impeachment, I should say. But 
his focus is on doing, delivering on what the American people elected him to do, which is to uh, get relief to the, to the American people, to get the pandemic under control, to ensure working families can put food on the table, and that's where he feels his efforts should be, should remain. Okay, go ahead. Thanks, Ben. Does the White House have a, a comment on this social media profile that has uh, emerged of Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene? Um, and is there a response to whether any disciplinary action should be taken against her given everything that's come out? We don't, and I'm, I'm not going to speak further about her, uh, I think, in this briefing room. Okay. Um, and oh, go ahead. Oh, one more, if you don't mind, just kind of a little bit of a housekeeping. Um, sure. The last administration had suggested that uh, on the origins of the uh, COVID-19 virus that it may have originated in a lab in China. Um, it, it was never definitive. Do you have an update on that, on the origin where we are on that investigation? Uh, well, first, um, obviously, the um, uh, the misinformation, of course, that has we've seen also come out of um, of uh, some sources in China is, is of great concern to us. Uh, it's imperative that we get to the bottom of the early days of the pandemic in China, and we've been supportive of an international investigation that we feel should be robust and clear. Uh, we, our view is that we must prepare to draw on information collected and analyzed by our intelligence community, which is something that is ongoing, and to work, and also to continue work with our allies to evaluate um, uh, the report's credibility on the investigation once it's done. In addition, as you all know, Secretary of State was just, uh, Tony Blinken, was just sworn in uh, yesterday, and one of his priorities is, of course, ensuring that our staffing on the ground in Beijing, which is something that uh, fell back in the last administration, is returned to what it was prior, which means we want to have uh, science uh, experts, uh, policy experts on the ground in the roles that they should be serving in uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, we're also there representing, um, you know, our interests uh, from the United States on the ground in, in China. Go ahead. A couple quick ones that I still don't think I fully understand. I know the executive order that was signed, but has this White House invoked the DPA and how soon till we'll actually see companies compelled to produce supplies or vaccine or whatever else that impacts Americans? Uh, we, it was invoked um, the day it was signed, within 24 hours of it being signed. So that jump-started the process, so I guess that meant it was invoked. Yes, and I confirmed that uh, when it was uh, the next day, the following day in the briefing room, which I realize everybody can't be here every day because of right. COVID. Um, but uh, it was invoked, and it means that our work is ongoing uh, with uh, companies to ensure that we are expediting the manufacturing of materials to ensure that we can get 100 million shots in the arms of Americans. And I know there's been some confusion about this and what exactly it is. What does the DPA mean? Uh, there are a few examples that our team has cited, including uh, vac on vaccine supply, low dead space syringes, which means it allows for the ability to get an extra dose into the Pfizer vial, which is important to getting more doses out there. Uh, help uh, additional N95, the production of additional N95 masks, uh, isolation gowns, uh, gloves, pipette tips, and high absorbency foam swabs. So we're really talking about very specific materials that can be used by vaccinators to get these shots in the arms of Americans. Thanks for clarifying. There was some confusion on the earlier call, which is why I re repeat it here. Let me ask one other mm -hmm. question. Yesterday you deflected this to the USOC, but my question's a little bit different today. We're now hearing from the organizers of this year's Summer Games in Japan, and the head of Japan's Olympics Committee is seeking public reassurances from President Biden himself, given that the U.S., of course, is the largest uh, contingent of athletes, that the game should be able to go on. As the, world's, uh, as the world is dealing with the pandemic right now, based on where we are now with the vaccine, does President Biden believe the games in Japan can safely go on? Well, the president, and I'm not sure if this readout had gone out yet, but he had spoken with uh, the prime minister of Japan earlier this morning, and a readout was going out um, as we were coming out to the briefing. I'm not sure if they spoke about the Olympics. I'm happy to check with our national security team on that uh, to, to follow up with, but I don't have any more assessment of the Olympics uh, at this point in time. Whether, whether he has, So it hasn't been discussed whether he has a position on whether it would safely be able to go on yet. I, I, I don't have anything more other than I, I haven't had much on it, but I don't have anything more than I've had on other days on it. So we ask, so we'll follow up. With uh, understood, and they just had a call this morning, but I haven't had a chance to talk to him specifically about it. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Jen. Two vaccine questions. First of all, this came up on the COVID call earlier, but how seriously is the White House considering using the Defense Production Act to compel other pharmaceutical companies to produce the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines to be supplied? 
Well, I didn't hear the entirety of the call uh, because we were doing some preparation for the event this afternoon. Uh, but from listening to our team talk about it, um, they're obviously manufacturing uh, facilities that have the capacity and the ability to get these vaccine doses um, out. Uh, and we don't want to get our get behind the pace of uh, and, and start from scratch, I should say, in, in ensuring that they're ready to do that. I don't think our concern at this point is whether or not we're going to have the vaccine doses. Obviously, uh, the president announced yesterday uh, the intention to purchase doses, additional doses, the um, our confidence in the manufacturers to have those doses available. Uh, the concerns we have are, uh, one, contingency planning and all of the different things that can happen because this is a Herculean task that has never been done before, but also ensuring we have vaccinators, we have vaccine sites, et cetera, available. So I have not uh, heard from our team uh, plans to seek other manufacturers uh, at this point in time, um, and I'm happy to follow up with them and see if there's anything additional. And then on the 200 million doses, the president said he's ordering them. Mm -hmm. What is the status of that order? Have Pfizer and Moderna agreed to produce 100 million doses each, and how quickly do they say they can do it? Well, uh, we expect to get the doses by mid to late summer, uh, the, the majority of doses by mid to late summer, some earlier than that. So we are confident that we'll be able to uh, get those from the manufacturers, yes. Uh, go ahead, Karen. Jen, a couple of questions on schools. Does the administration plan to develop metrics or standards for what a safe reopening of schools will look like? Uh, we do, and, and our CDC director, and I'm not sure, again, if she was asked about this important question, I know as a fellow mother, um, but we will have um, uh, specifics uh, 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 that we'll, we'll defer to the uh, CDC on, on the safe reopening of schools. As you know, the president talked about, uh, has talked about his commitment and his goal of reopening most K through eight schools within 100 days. There are obviously a number of steps that will need to be taken in order for that to be possible. But he has directed the Department of Education, the Department of Health and Human Services to provide guidance on safe reopening uh, and operating for schools, child care providers and institutions of higher education. But as our COVID team has outlined, that's going to require um, testing materials, support for contact tracing, vaccinations for te teachers, and ensuring they're equitably provided. But uh, our, the, our CDC director and team will be uh, looking into putting together some specific guidelines so there can be clarity on that front, which and I know a lot of districts are looking for. Those but. things you mentioned all cost a lot of money, and a big part of the COVID relief package is a lot of money to go to school mm -hmm. reopening. If Congress doesn't approve the money you want and schools don't have what they need to pay for things to open safely, would the president support teachers staying at home and support virtual learning continuing through this entire school year? Well, um, I think the president recognizes, as we all do, the value of having children in schools and, and doing that in a safe way, which is one of the reasons he set this ambitious goal of reopening uh, most K-8 through schools within 100 days. But one of the reasons that this, uh, the funding for uh, safe reopening, for getting schools the equipment, the testing, the uh, ventilation in some cases that they need is because nobody wants to be having a conversation in May or June about why schools are not reopened. So this goes back to the argument that our team has been making and all of these calls and engagements and meetings that I outlined about the importance and vital nature of each component of the package. So we won't get into a hypothetical. We are confident that Congress will move forward with a package. Let me just go, oh, we gotta wrap up soon, okay? I'm sorry, we'll, we'll do more questions tomorrow, but we had two such great guests. Um, Jen, go ahead. Thanks, I just have two quick questions. Um, one is just on the climate actions today. They leave out Treasury's Financial Stability Oversight Council, which experts say could play an influential role in addressing climate risks. This is the administration of plans to take action on climate finance um, and should FSOC direct agencies and regulators to address climate change? Well, I'm going to use a reference that um, my, my friend and colleague, Ambassador Susan Rice, used yesterday, which is there are 1,453 da days left in this administration. And uh, addressing climate and the crisis of climate is uh, an issue that uh, the president has conveyed to members of his cabinet, members of his senior team is an absolute priority. So. Secretary Yellen has been in, in her role for one day, but um, certainly I'd send you to them for any more specifics, but this is the beginning, not the end of our work on climate. Nadia, oh, go ahead. Around. Um, is the White House concerned about the stock market activity we're seeing around GameStop, um, and now with some other stocks as well, uh, including the 
a subsidiary or whatever, the, the company that was uh, Blockbuster. Um, and have there been any conversations with the F SEC about uh, how to proceed? Well, um, I'm also happy to repeat that we have the first female Treasury Secretary and a team that's surrounding her and often questions about market we will send to them. But our team is, of course, our economic team, including Secretary Yellen and others, are monitoring uh, the situation. It's a good reminder, though, that the stock market isn't the only measure of the health of our, econo of our economy. It doesn't reflect how working and middle class families are doing. Uh, as you all know from covering this, we're in the midst of a K-shaped recovery. America's workers are struggling to make ends meet, which is why the President has introduced this urgent package to get immediate relief to families. All right, I'm going to go Nadia, and then we'll be totally done because everybody has to go. Okay, Thank go you. ahead. Thank you, Jane. Good to see you on a different podium. I have two questions, sure. one about COVID and one about China. Okay. Uh, regarding COVID, the President promised to increase supply to states by 10 million doses. Yet, statistics show that 47% of Americans are hesitant to take the vaccine, despite that the president, the vice president, took it publicly. What is the administration doing uh, to convince Americans to take it to reach the uh, herd immunity by, say, 70 percent by the by the fall? You're absolutely right, Nadia, that this is one of the biggest challenges we face. And for anyone who tuned into the briefing that our health team led this morning, it was one of the first issues that CDC Director uh, Dr. Walensky raised. Um, and one of the things we're doing is prioritizing providing uh, correct information about it. Uh, and you know, the vaccines, and one, so I'll take the opportunity, uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are safe and effective. That's one of the things she said today. They were tested in large clinical trials to make sure they meet safety standards. About 30 percent of U.S. participants in those trials were Hispanic, African American, Asian or Native American. About half were older adults. And so we want to provide clear data, as I just did, but also we want to meet people where they are, communicate directly with communities of color, people who have concerns, and use medical and health professionals to do exactly that. Okay, you had a China question, and then you really have to go, but go ahead. Um, and second, many welcome to your rejoining of the WHO, yet some wants to push for a transparent investigation into the relationship between China and WHO. And also, yesterday in her uh, hearing in the Senate, uh, Governor uh, Raimondi declined uh, to blacklist Huawei technology in the U.S. Is this kind of some kind of caving into China, or is that a nuanced uh, way to deal with China? Uh, so I think you're, the second reference, I think, was to Huawei, right? And then come, yes. Um, so let me just convey clearly our position on this. Um, uh, let us be clear, telecommunications equipment made by untrusted vendors, including Huawei, is a threat to the security of the U.S. and our allies. We'll ensure that the American telecommunications network do not use equipment from untrusted vendors and will work with allies to secure their telecommunications networks and make investments to expand the production of telecommunications equipment by trusted U.S. and allied companies. Uh, again, we'll take many more questions tomorrow. Uh, thank you all. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.